I'm Dr. Michael Latola. And I'm Megan Strong. In today's Case of the Week, we find out what happens when you combine a translucent crown with a dark stump shape. And in honor of Shark Week, we've got a story of mystery teeth in the news. And a woman tries to save her dog from being attacked by another dog by using her dentures. That and more on today's Chairs I'd Like. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 141 of Chairside Live. We have for you today what I like to call a good episode. Megan, how are you? I am good, good. Um, but I'm also tired raising a, well, she'll be one in, wow, that's crazy, 12 days from now, um, is exhausting work and I'm tired. Yeah, she's she's probably tired too. Yep. No, Her, she sleep. No, she sleeps well. Really? Yeah. My, I always hated that expression. Sleep. Oh, I slept like a baby. Well, then you must have slept horribly. I agree. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. I want to sleep like my cat. That's yeah. that is sleep. That is. There's something about seeing a cat like curled up like a cinnamon roll sleeping Ooh, cinnamon for roll. hour 18 mm-hmm. uh, of the day, just curled up with no, not splayed all over like humans are, but right. just curled up in this mm. little ball, and it's just like, wow, that's. Yeah. That's what I want to do. I want to be able to sleep like that for just a couple days. But How are you doing? Are you tired? Are I'm doing you... all right. No, I'm recovering. I don't uh, have much travel at all in July. This nice. is a light month for lectures, and I actually really didn't book any. And so uh, I get to be here for a solid four weeks and not see the inside of an airplane, not get frisked by a TSA agent. Although Bummer. I'm going to miss Kidding. that a little bit. But, right. Uh, <laughs> pre-check keeps most of that from happening. But we've got an interesting case of the week for you today. You know, we've talked about anterior bruxer before on the show and it, I get a lot of questions about it at lectures now. It's the newest version of bruxer that was introduced in about March of this year, March 2015. And it's uh, not quite as strong as bruxer, but it's for use in the anterior where it doesn't need to be as strong. The biting forces aren't as intense and it's more translucent. And so it, it looks more like a natural tooth. It absorbs more light as opposed to regular Bruxer, and so we called it anterior Bruxer. The runner-up name was aesthetic Bruxer. But in today's case of the week, you're gonna see that uh, just because it's a more aesthetic restoration does not always lead to a more aesthetic result, especially if the dentist doesn't give their lab uh, a heads up about the stump shade underneath it. And so this really does come into play. So let's take a look at that now. We talked before on the show about anterior Bruxer and how it's more translucent than regular Bruxer. And of course, you can see the anterior Bruxer sticker on the outside of this case. And so it's an interesting uh, case because the doctor prescribed it. And I want to show you what happened here. Let's take a look at the impression. We've got an anterior double arch tray and looks to be uh, done simultaneously with both viscosities of materials when I hold it up to the light. Um, I can see that uh, the patient did bite down all the way, and so we've got a you know, pretty darn good impression here. Let's take a look at the model. Nice prep. Good looking prep. Good looking reduction. That's plenty of room for Bruxer. That's plenty of room for Emacs. That's, uh, Really plenty of room for, uh, for anything. And uh, we always look, you know, one of the things technicians always look at is, and this is something that's a little hard to see in the mouth. It's much easier to see on a digital uh, impression, for example. So when I do, like if I take a digital impression of this tooth, I will always look at the virtual model on the screen from this angle and then try to take the most facial part of the preparation and look at it. Um, with the adjacent unprepared tooth next to it. This is this spot right here, the junction of the incisal third and the middle third, is a really easy thing to leave too bulky. And, and a lot of times it's once you get the stone model where you compare where this is compared to this to go, ooh, we, we may or may not have enough room here. It looks like we have enough room here. Uh, in my, that reverse prep technique, I do put a depth cut right here at the junction of the incisal and middle third to make sure that we don't get kind of a bucky beaver prep. And you can see how this prep along the facial surface in the incisal half does in fact tilt back towards the lingual, uh, which is nice. So, so far a a really great job um, from the dentist and we sent uh, the dentist a uh, Bruxer, an anterior Bruxer crown. Let's take a look at that. 
So maybe hard to see here, but definitely a little more translucent than, um, than regular Bruxer. And the issue was it was being placed on a tooth that had had endodontic treatment. And when the doctor put it in place, even though this is an A1 shade, which is the shade the doctor requested, it did not look like that in the mouth. And the dentist sent a picture along to show how grayed out that uh, anterior Bruxer came, uh, crown became when it was placed on that dark stump. And again, here it is in place with the A1, the Vita A1 shade tab next to it. And um, this is something that we know about anterior Bruxer and Emacs for that matter, that as you get a more aesthetic material, uh, it therefore becomes more translucent and uh, as a result can show the tooth underneath it. So how, as a dentist, do you know when you have to worry about that stump shade or not? Well, what we use in the lab is um, what I think is pretty much the standard, and that's the Ivoclar Vivident Natural Dye Material. Um, if you used to do Empress veneers, you might have an old one of these with ST on it, which we used to say for stump shade, but if you flip the new one, these new, uh, the natural dye uh, guides over, you'll see how these shades relate to what was really those ST shades was the Empress stump material, stump with an F. Thanks for the Germans for throwing that in there and making it impossible to pronounce. And you can see how those older ST um, shade tabs for the Empress stump shade compared to the new natural dye material, uh, as it's called. And so really this is what we use now. We talk about the ND shades for the natural dye because they sell, of course, this in dye material as well that we can put on the inside of a crown like this to uh, check it before it goes out. So my advice is if you're going to be doing more translucent anterior restorations like Emacs, um, like anterior Bruxer, this is a really good investment to have uh, one of these stump shade guides. Um, you're not going to find that there's a ton of teeth that are dead ringers necessarily for these shades, uh, but really if you just pick the closest one, so on a tooth like this, it's probably this, when you get that kind of blackish you know, look or dark gray look, and really just a, a photograph of the ND9 tab next to the tooth so our technician has an idea of how dark it is compared to this. And they can even combine these together to make their, their own shades. But um, pretty much the, the rule of thumb here is that once you get south of, say, ND4, so all of these over here, the 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, if the stump shade is you know a, a really dark gray or a brown or this one actually even though it's you know not an you know awful shade of yellow perhaps again the value is so high that that's going to uh, show through those crowns as well and so these four you can get away with almost anything on top of it you know whether it's Emacs or anterior Bruxer uh, in this range it's going to work fine uh, but you're going to get grays and other colors bleeding through on the five through nine. And, and the more important thing to think of besides just what you know, shade these each happen to be is if you're gonna try to go from these shades, like this patient was, going from a stump of an ND9 to an A1. That's a huge leap, you know, if you kind of took like a Vita shade guide and held it over here. You know, when you get down into these shades, we really can't go more than about two shades lighter, say in terms of value. So to go from any of these, to an A3, um, A3.5, you know, would be fine. A2's a stretch, A1's a no-no, and B1's definitely not going to happen. So it's not just about what is the stump shade. It's about how big the spread is between the stump shade and the final desired shade of the restoration. Um, you just can't make that huge leap to A1 from these shades. Not with Emacs and not with anterior Bruxer. Um, we've actually made the uh, patient... I mean, we made the doctor a regular Bruxer crown that we're going to uh, send out now. Um, so they're going to be able to place that on and not have to worry about this color influencing that final color like we saw it happening here. You can de obviously, it's cl clear, as a, clear as a bell to see that kind of a dark shade bleeding through there. Um, the doctor could if they really wanted to have a you know, more aesthetic crown such as Emacs uh, or anterior Bruxer have gone in and actually done some, uh, add some white composite to the front of that preparation and kind of opaque it and keep it from showing through. But I don't know, that seems a, a little dicey kind of at times. And yes, we could probably put some internal opaque on the inside of the anterior Bruxer crown 
but again, that's just a, a little bit dicey too. And probably the safer thing is to use a less, you know, translucent uh, material. And so, you know, I took this particular uh, patient's uh, solid model and put some black on there. And you can definitely see the difference when the crown uh, goes into place, you know, with that Sharpie on the background, how it really kind of dulls and, and darkens things. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, you can't, you really don't know until you try it in. But I think, you know, like I said, if you're going to be doing, you can really kind of almost see the prep outline showing through there when you look at it like that. If you're going to be doing these more translucent restorations, it is really helpful to have this, um, uh, the natural dye uh, shade guides in there and, and let your lab know, you know, if you're down in the five to nine region and certainly take a picture, just like you would take a picture with the A1 shade tab in place saying here, you know, we want to match this. See, here's the A1. I would have liked to see the shade tab over here next to number nine if that's what we're trying to match so they can see number nine. But you're gonna also take one of the prep itself with one of these in. And that will ensure that not only does the technician see how the final crown should relate to the shade tab, but also how the prep itself relates to it. And uh, that will allow them to either possibly opaque the inside of the crown or more likely suggest the use of a less translucent uh, material such as regular Bruxer uh, so that you can in fact block out that dark stump shade. Thank you for that, Dr. D. That's why I get the big bucks. Okay. Let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's Viewer Mail comes to us from Dr. Nabil Khan, and he writes, Dear Dr. Jatol and Megan, My son and I enjoy watching Chairside Live, but for some strange reason, he loses interest in the first few minutes and starts banging on the keys of my laptop. I, however, watch the show in its entirety and am always able to pick up something new to better my dentistry. I have two questions and concerns. In my personal experience, I have noticed that there is more cold sensitivity with the Bruxer crowns compared to the PFMs that I used to use a year back, a couple years back. Why is that? Is it because of the weaker bond strength of the cement to the zirconia? Any suggestions? I use AvaClean. Z Prime and cement with Fujisim by GC America. I usually remove the temporary and, cl and clean any cement on the tooth. I then gently dry the tooth with the 2x2. Two two. I know you have recommended applying Gluma and using a high speed suction to dry the tooth. Do you anesthetize the patient for this application as it may be painful? Lastly, there are a few times when I have received Bruxer crowns back from Glidewell and the proximal contacts are light and non-existent. Do you think we can fabricate a Bruxer crown in the near future to which we may add flowable composite to reestablish the contacts? Because that would make us all very happy. Whew. And he also says, I see that you always give out a pho photograph of yourself and Megan. So I'm sending one of you and my son, of you and my son. No, he's not. <laughs> that would be weird. He is sending one of him and his son, Adam. Let's see. Look oh, that is cute. cute. Isn't that precious? That, that is precious. We'll put up a color version, too, so they okay. can see it. Nice. Uh, well, Dr. Khan, wow, you, you ask uh, a lot and some very interesting questions, and I'm going to keep the letter up here just in case I get lost in, in the middle and forget what I'm trying to answer. So question number one, um, why would Bruxer restorations be more sensitive than PFM restorations? That I, I don't think it has anything to do uh, with the material itself. We've done, um, between us and the affiliated partner labs, the 205 labs who also sell Bruxer, um, we really haven't heard that back from people, and there's been like 7 million uh, crowns made now since uh, Bruxer launched. So that's not something that I've experienced um, or other people have. I, I get the feeling it's a statistical thing for some reason. I mean, maybe, you know, when we look back at it or when you look back at it five years from now, it'll turn out that, no, it seems like it's kind of about uh, the same. But there's really no reason why it would, you know, behave uh, any differently uh, as because of a, being a monolithic restoration versus the bilayered restoration. Um, you would almost expect uh, cast gold crowns, for example, to be maybe the most cold sensitive of all. I guess when you get cold on there and it's a solid metal versus a structural ceramic like Bruxer, but I don't think most dentists feel that there's an increase in cold sensitivity on the crowns either. So I'm not sure. I really can't give you an answer for why that might be happening. I don't want to deny it's happening in your practice, but you know, hopefully it's just a, kind of a statistical aberration for now. Kind of like if you flip a coin a hundred times, you might get heads, you know, 10 times in a row before it, before it evens out. Um, but you ask about the rest of the protocol as well and the products you are using um, are fantastic. You're doing all the right things. 
Um, you asked about the, the gluma being placed, and we used to do it, as you suggested, at the crown seat appointment. And so there were some people who definitely did have to be anesthetized for that, and some people who did not have to be anesthetized. And frankly, it was tough to tell. And it's kind of tough to tell, you know, even before you take the temporary off. It's always kind of a, a judgment call. And then one day I thought, well, wait a minute. If we're putting on this, these two coats of gluma, uh, to desensitize the tooth and kill 99% of the bacteria per Rella Christensen, you know, two coats for one minute each, and like you said, evaporate with the high volume suction. Why aren't we doing this at the temporization appointment? So we prep the tooth, take an impression. Why aren't we putting two coats on before we put the temporary on? Because we know temporaries have a tendency to leak, and they're being cemented on with a cement that's designed to fail. You know, we, we want it to be able to take it off in two weeks. And so it's, it's designed to kind of fall off. And we know temporaries leak. So why not put the two coats on then? And Rella said, well, you certainly could. And she said, are you planning on um, putting it on in the seat appointment too? And I said, yes. Yeah. She said, that's fine. You know, it's only about 10 microns thick. So that'd be, you know, 40 microns if you, you know, got it on there and, and, it, was all, and it all stayed on. 40 microns uh, of the gluma. We're leaving, you know, 70 microns of, of dive space on the crown. So there's plenty of room because most of our cements are about 15 microns thick. So we did have to anesthetize, as you suggest, but what we're doing now is before the temporary goes on, two one-minute coats of gluma, then the temporary goes on. Now, the other thing we've done as a pilot project is we're shortening the time between prep and seat, and I see all kinds of great benefits about that, and we'll talk about that in a future uh, episode. But most of the time, I'm seating crowns on day three or day four after they've been prepped, and what I'm finding is when we take the temporary crowns off that the teeth are still desensitized uh, from those initial two coats of gluma before the temporary was put on. And so we're able to do seats with less sensitivity without having to give uh, any kind of local anesthesia. And again, since it's leaking, why not protect and get that coat of armor on the tooth, uh, knowing the temporary is going to leak, but there's still now more bacteria on the tooth. So we're going to do the two coats again at the crown seat, kill everything, and then do our permanent cementation, uh, as you mentioned. So my solution has been to do it before the temp goes on and also at the seat appointment. And if they're close enough together, the desensitization from putting it on before the temporary goes on will usually linger into the crown seat appointment. So you can put it on again and do whatever you have to do without causing too much uh, sensitivity to the patient. I like what you're doing with the two by two. That's great. I also use wooden toothpicks. As you've no doubt discovered, it's taking a metal instrument touching it to the patient's tooth that sends them up to the ceiling, whereas the two by two or a wooden toothpick for a stubborn piece of temporary cement won't cause any problems. And lastly, I think you mentioned uh, what's the deal with some of the crowns you're receiving from the lab, some of the Bruxer crowns having contacts that were light or non-existent. Um, we work with roughly 48,000 dentists per month that order at least one thing from us, and a lot of those are Bruxer crowns. And so when we look at, let's say, 30,000 doctors, we have to look at what uh, the majority of their complaints are. You know, high occlusion is a big one and having and tight contacts, having to adjust on contacts too much. When you see that across a 60% of dentists, for example, you know you need to make some changes. Now, those changes aren't going to fit everybody. They're not going to fit outliers here and here, but it's going to fit that big swath right down the middle. And so when we design crowns today, we actually design them where the contacts are five microns open. That's one of the parameters you can enter uh, into the software is the crown is designed five microns open. You know, this is, it fits into the concept of physiologic relief and teeth aren't supposed to be jammed up next to each other. But we measured six different brands of dental floss as well. And they range in thickness from about 45 microns to about 65. I like glide floss, which is 60 microns thick. So when you design a crown five microns open and then go through it with a 60 micron floss, you do still get a snap uh, as you go through it because there's still you know 55 microns uh, of tension in between there between the floss and the opening itself. So today it's kind of a, a numbers game for us where we're trying to make the maximum amount of dentists happy and five microns seems to do that because it brings the complaints of tight contacts and having to adjust too much way down without raising the complaints of these contacts seem light or open up too much and so it's this, kind of this delicate balancing act. My dream, and what we hope as a company, is one day there will be an app. There will be a Glidewell app where for all of your crowns or for individual crowns, if you're doing a digital impression, you can simply go into the app and set these parameters yourself. So maybe at five microns open, there's a doctor who's still having to adjust too much because his assistant is accidentally removing the contacts from the temporary or we're getting drifting. He can go on and say, I want to have my contacts 10 microns open or 15. 
you would go into the app and say, boy, these contacts have really been light. And you take that slider bar and move it over to zero. So the crowns would be designed to be in contact with the adjacent teeth. And you may find that for your combination of you, your assistant, how she polishes temporaries, uh, and the crowns we're designing, now that works out best for you. So we're, we're getting closer to a day where you can actually um, not only set your own parameters, but you can do it for specific cases as well. And furthermore, if you were really interested, we could send the design back to you. We could give you a piece of software for your computer. You would take the impression, send it to us. We'd pour it up, we'd scan it, we'd design the crown, send it back to you. You could put it into that software and actually adjust the design yourself and play with the contacts and then email it back to us and we would mill the crown for you. So part of the beauty of CAD CAM dentistry is hopefully we're going to be able to give you more control over your restorations because as, is, as it is now, we have to work with a large group of dentists and try to make most of them happy. Uh, and it's a difficult thing when there's individual people you know, having certain issues because their assistants are taught never touch the contacts. Right. You know, and so there's always going to be good ta- contact, but if an assistant goes in and accidentally polishes, it might be something like what Nabil's finding where the contacts are still light. So thank you for bringing up a, a couple good issues, giving us a chance to talk about. Thank you for sending the picture of you and your yeah, son. so cute. Thank you for telling us that he loves watching Megan in the beginning of the show and then loses interest when my ugly mug comes on the screen. Maybe we will, no. we will edit. To, I'll tell you what we'll do. We will edit together the first three minutes of all 141 episodes so your son can just sit and watch the Megan parts and the Megan outtakes. I think Mickey Mouse Clubhouse is probably more interesting I than I think that. that's probably not the first request we've had for that, by the okay. way, too. And as he predicted, we yes. are going to send him what? A photograph. Of you, me, and his son. What was he doing here? No. So we've got a couple different options, but this one is... I think this one is the one we'll send because it is so lovely. We're both just ga- gazing off into producer James' eyes. Right. So happy. His Those dark brown eyes and the bushy, out-of-control eyebrows. We're just glazing, gazing into that yes. lost. The other ones are a bit silly. So, um, yeah, I'm, that's, that's goofy. Yeah. I that, feel like his son might like the middle one, though. Uh, because I have crazy eyes? Yeah. I think that... Uh, I don't know. That's part of his attraction to you, but maybe okay. not. And a reverse prep kit, uh, Dr. Khan, if you haven't had a chance to use that. Um, that's something that could be fun. Uh, give that a try and see what you think about that. And thanks for writing in. Yes. As always, do you have any news? I do. Four teeth were recently discovered on a pier in North Tonawanda, New York. Police took the teeth, all molars, to a dentist who determined that they were human teeth. A team of divers spent two and a half hours near the pier looking for other clues, but came back empty-handed. Officials say the teeth were intact, including the root, and looked fairly fresh. Police were investigating the case to see if the teeth had anything to do with the recent murder of a local woman. Turns out they are unrelated. Dental records trace the teeth back to a man whose wisdom teeth had been extracted. Police did not say how the molars ended up there, only that the man inadvertently abandoned the teeth after surgery. Oh, that's funny. Um, When I saw the story, um, when you said, hey, do you want to do this story? I read the headline and I read the first, like, paragraph. Right. I I didn't see that last paragraph. And exactly what I was thinking was, and why I wanted to say it was, this seems really obvious to me that it was probably wisdom teeth, that somebody had four wisdom teeth taken Mm -hmm. out. Um, a lot of times patients will ask for them afterwards yeah. and, um, and do God knows what. We've seen celebrities make earrings out of it and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, uh, you know, I just thought that somebody looked at it and maybe got grossed out or maybe just decided to chuck them. But it seems so obvious that it was four. They were all molars. And I like that they take it to a dentist so he can determine they were human. Right. I mean, were you confused that they might have been shark teeth? <laughs> yeah, I they mean, don't look all that, all that much the same. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but the thing that threw me off is when they said there was... Uh, Roots present, because typically, you know, wisdom teeth, although he might have been a little bit older, um, usually won't have, by the time you try to take them out, right. they don't have uh, fully fused roots yet. There's only kind of partial yeah. partial roots there. But uh, it was funny that they went, like, diving to find the rest of the person. <laughs> it was kind of like, yeah, so four bad. teeth just happened right. to be Right, we're just and, on the, yeah. But, and actually, when I first found this story, they hadn't discovered that it was, they hadn't traced the records back, and that... Part of the that part of the story, that information that solved the case, um, is just they recently discovered it. So right. when I was editing the story, that is brand new information. So that story is current. Up oh, to date. got it. Okay, yes. so I did read the whole thing, and it did you did. Okay. Yes, it did not at the time, but now. 
Because when, exactly. once you know, once you just look at them, wisdom teeth look like wisdom teeth for right. the most part. And any dentist should have been able to say, these are human, these are wisdom teeth. It just makes sense. You know, to go see if it had anything to do with the case of the missing woman. Well, not unless she was abducted by a dentist who, right. who had an urge to remove her wisdom teeth and first before. Sure. And wouldn't the dentist who had to, you know, determine whether they were human teeth or not, wouldn't he have said kind of what you had just mentioned? Like, okay, here's probably what happened. Right. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, they might have brought it in and said, what do you make of this, Johnny? Right. Anyway, they're human. All right, got it, thanks. Rough, yeah. Like if it was so, an old 50s cop show. Sure. Anything else? Yes. A brave grandmother bit a German shepherd in a desperate attempt to stop it from mauling her little dog. The 80-year-old woman was walking with her Yorkshire Terrier, Millie, when the off-leash shepherd attacked. The woman bit the dog with her dentures to save Millie, but only got a mouthful of hair. She says it was pure instinct, just trying to save her dog. Sadly, the bite didn't stop the dog and Millie was killed. The owner of the attack dog has agreed to muzzle their dog and made a financial contribution to the victim. That's really sad. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna out copyright a copywriter, but I'm pretty sure hair on an animal is called fur. But just a, just, just a small point. Listen to this guy. I like the sound of mouthful of mouthful of fur. And part Actually, of it was Actually, isn't it when like the undercoat's fur and the top's hair? Oh, interesting. I don't know. Google? Any help? We'll see if I uh, we'll get an answer on that. But yeah, she that's amazing because uh, think about walking with a little dog and a bigger one. In fact, I was running the other day mm-hmm. and this pit bullish like dog started to come over to me. Uh-huh. And I'm not real, I'm not afraid of dogs, right. not at all. In fact, it kind of ran over to me and went to kind of sniff my leg as I was running by. And um, for a briefest of seconds, I thought about, should I kick it away, which I didn't think I should? Okay. Or what if I was running with a taser? You know, it just, you, you, if you don't have a plan, you just don't know what you're going to do when something like that happens. Right. So she's walking a little dog. The big one bites it. That's pretty amazing to me that she drops down onto all fours and starts she's biting the dog. I, mm-hmm. I love that kind of mother bear survival instinct yeah if she would have had some mini implants mm-hmm. you know to stabilize that denture or maybe a hybrid i feel like she would have got more less fur more skin and maybe gotten the dog off of there um i guess hindsight's twenty twenty, but biting it as opposed to like poking it in the eye like they always say if you're being attacked by a shark Shark. to hit it in the nose Nose, to, to disorient it and so but i like i like biting it the you know know man man bites dog um, kind of headline turnaround and uh, super sad, but she seemed to be like getting through it. And... Yeah, she actually, um, the story goes on to say that she is very sad, but she doesn't blame the family. I guess somebody had left the gate open, which is why how the dog um, escaped, but she just said she was just trying to protect her little friend. Um, if, my, if my cat was being attacked, I would place kick whatever, in the ribs, kick right. as hard as I could. Yeah. And it would probably go flying, whatever it was, sure. uh, with the cat. So it's not the best idea. But I think my instinct would be, uh, yeah, to just pounce on the <laughs> other animal. And, and, I'm not and sure, bite, I, would, I'm not sure I would enter into the fight right. with my teeth. But Well, call it me gave crazy. me thought. And uh, we're at uh, Glidewell. We're here to announce the introduction of our new uh, Simply Natural Denture that uh, if you bite and it senses fur, uh, sharp metal uh, uh, spikes come out and will mm. kill whatever animal you're biting. Uh, and, and if a man's arm is hairy enough, it'll register as fur, too, if you're being attacked. So look for those in 2016. That about wraps it up for this edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, Megan, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next time. For some strange reason... R E S H O N. R E S B E C T. <laughs> Megan, are you in here again? That's in. Why don't they call an M a double N? Like they do a W. w. Double N. I don't want to out copyright a copywriter, but I'm pretty sure hair on an animal is called fur. <laughs>